Hi, I'm Bright Garlic, and I'd like to tell you about an alien encounter that I had on January 19th, 2011. You can read a little bit about the backstory of what happened on my blog, Otherworldly Encounters. Uh, the address for that blog is otherworldlyencounters.wordpress.com. Just a little bit of background. Um, I have an honours degree in applied science, which I did many years ago, and also a distinction or a, a Bachelor of Social Work with distinction. I also uh, have worked in the social work field for more than 10 years with lots of people with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, psychotic episodes, the full range of so-called mental illnesses, I'm also a Buddhist, or at least uh, I follow the core teachings of the Buddhist doctrine. I started with Tibetan Buddhism and then Zen, and now I kind of follow both, I guess. But I also bring to that uh, an understanding of Taoist principles and also indigenous spiritualities from many places on earth, but particularly here in Australia. So I have an eclectic kind of spirituality. I've had lifelong encounters with aliens. Uh, some people might say extraterrestrials, other people might say visitors. I do not believe in the abduction phenomenon and I think that that was a, a meme if you like that was created probably in the 60s to create fear and division among people. I, much, I feel much more comfortable with the, the term contactee or experiencer and in my experience um, there hasn't been anything that fits the so-called abduction paradigm, um, force, forcibly taken against your own will and all that kind of stuff. At some level there has always been agreement, although not always consciously, I know that's been there. Why am I doing this at this time? I'm doing it because I first started writing about the story a year ago when it happened and I began to try and write about it on my blog and realised that for one it was very emotional and it was very difficult going through it and I thought it's very difficult to convey that emotion and two, I realised there was so much that happened I couldn't just convey it in, in writing on the blog. So I I thought since then, in recent times, that I might start writing a book about all my encounters and try and explain that set of encounters then. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know when I'm going to get around to writing a book. You know, I've got other books that I'm working on. So maybe it would be good for me to try and put together some sort of video so that people have something to go by. Um, you know, put some meat on the bones of that story, so to speak. So that's what I'm trying to do today. And what I want to do is give you a bit of background to the story and also, um, you know, take you through on a physical journey along the way, showing you most of the places where the experience took place and talking to you a little bit about what happened and trying to convey some of the emotion of what happened. That's a really important part of it. Now, I won't be sharing everything. This will be a summary of sorts. And I don't even know if in the book I'll share everything because a lot of it was intensely personal and really quite overwhelming. And I, I struggled to be able to deal with a lot of that myself and I'm not sure that other people will be able to deal with that. So I'll only share some things. So a bit of background to the story. Um, For about the last five years or so, I've been working on developing a range of techniques that would allow me to have conscious contact with my alien friends. As I said, I've had lifelong contact and I can remember that going back to when I was a small boy. I was told it's been there since the beginning. I've had contact um, with many different races, all very vastly different to one another. I've never had contact with any, well, that's not true, bar one contact, few of the contacts or none of the contacts that I've had have been with beings that have been described by other people. 
you know, none of that, I've had one encounter with the so-called greys, but none of the other so-called typical encounters. And so I, it's very difficult for me to talk to people because people come with these preconceived ideas of what aliens are and notions of abduction and there are all these UFO and alienology experts out there and they'll tell you about all the different types of aliens. Well, I haven't encountered half the, or most of the, the races that they talk about and my encounters have been so different. So I want to put some of that on record anyway. I, five years ago, as I said, started developing techniques and um, most of that influence came from a person very close to me. And then about oh, two or three weeks, I think, before the experience, I was uh, out with the same person and we were working on contact and we had many experiences over that week interacting with the lights, um, lights in the sky, lights on the mountains, lights around us, and they were seeing the entities. I couldn't see them, but I could feel them and hear them speaking to me. And at one point they said that I wasn't ready. They, they said to this person I was with that I wasn't ready at that time and that they would return on January 19th for me to have a full encounter with them, a full face-to-face -face conscious encounter. I was asked to look after myself, to keep my energy strong, stay away from computers that day. Uh, that meant when I w went to work, you know, not too much time on the computer, to not watch anything to do with aliens, not have any of that influence in my life, and to try and stay well rested. So I did that, and I was very anxious about what would happen. I had lots of questions I wanted to ask them. I wrote down 11 questions that I wanted to ask each race. And I also prepared a set of gifts, which I didn't end up giving them. Uh, and they weren't necessary anyway, but I felt I should do it. I'll tell you this, that I actually asked 12 questions of both races, but I wrote down some questions and had them in the back of my pocket. And I think I remembered some of them and others sort of ad hoc, because I didn't take it out of the back of my pocket. And so I was going to have an encounter with two races of aliens that I've had lifelong encounters with. And what you'll hear later on is me refer to one of them by name, but I'll refer to both of them by the colloquial name that I use. Uh, one is called the Brownies. And I last had a conscious encounter with the Brownies in August 97, but they were in a very different form. And the other are the tall aliens. And I last had a conscious encounter with the tall aliens in November 2009. You can read about that on my blog. I talk a little bit about that experience. Uh, the brownies are about three and a half to four foot. Um, exceptionally thin. Um, beigey, kind of yellowy skin. In terms of width, they're about this you know, I'm not a wide person, they're about this wide and very, very thin, very long, thin limbs. Uh, eyes aren't particularly big, look very childlike. Um, the tall aliens, you know, I call them tall for a goddamn good reason. They, uh, when I had the encounter in November, it happened near my garage and I was able to go out the next day and measure against the garage um, roughly how tall they were and, and compare that to the top of the garage and I had a tape and all the rest so I could measure it properly and I estimated that they were between 14 and 15 foot high and you can imagine that's a pretty big beam uh, being I'm six, two and a half, six three and I was looking up, you know the whole time. That's that's a creature that's more than twice my height and that's fairly intimidating when you're around something that big but they're not intimidating at all. So these were the two beings that I, or two races that I'd had previous experience with that I knew I was going to meet. I wasn't entirely sure that I was going to meet 
those two races because they never said you're going to meet X and Y or Y and Z. Um, it was just an intuitive feeling that they would be the ones that would come back. I felt very strongly um, that the tall aliens would come back. I didn't know so much about the brownies, but I felt, given the kind of interaction with I'd, that I'd had with them before, that, that they would be there. But I didn't know there might be more or, or less of just one. But just that gut, that intuitive sort of feeling. Um, so one of the reasons I'm making this is to say categorically that uh, I'm really pissed off with the attitude that a lot of people have that aliens are malevolent and hostile. And I want to tell you, they're not. They're not. I've had a great deal of contact and I've never encountered a hostile or malevolent alien. A couple that were maybe aloof but definitely not hostile. And in fact, quite the opposite has been true. They have been extremely benevolent, concerned about my welfare, and I would say they have a kind of universal compassion for all beings, all sentient beings, not just human beings. And I get really, really irritated hearing all this stuff about malevolent aliens. You know, from the crackpots like David Icke and the whole reptilian conspiracy and all that crap, and I can tell you reptilians don't exist, full stop. Um, and then there's Hollywood and the way that aliens are portrayed, you know, coming to invade us and take over. There are very few films where aliens are portrayed the way they really are. And I can tell you one film that I think kind of accurately portrays how they are is the film AI. In that film, at the end, the aliens are excavating some ice around, uh, might be New York or something, several thousand years in the future, and they un uncover this uh, android boy, and they speak to one another, and they decide to recreate a day for him in which he could be with his adopted mother, and they have this extreme reverence for life, even artificial life, so much so that, that they do this compassionate act for him. And that, to me, is more like what the real aliens are like. I don't care how many people criticise me. Um, a lot of stuff is not what you read. As I said, I think I said before, the abduction meme created to create hysteria and fear and division. And now, of course, it's part of culture. And people who have these experiences react to them with fear because... Uh, people aren't well grounded and, and people don't know how to react to them and some of them are real and some of them aren't and some of them of course are military abductions so for the most part what people take to be the real experience isn't and I would go so far as to say that the waters have been muddied about what are genuine encounters and what aren't and I don't want to say that my encounters are more real than so-and-so's, but I can tell you this is my experience, and in my experience, the aliens are benevolent and have a universal compassion for all sentient creatures. And not just sentient creatures, they have a reverence for, um, you know, Earth itself, and I'm sure all places. They have a reverence for existence, uh, the only people that I know of who speak in this way about aliens publicly are uh, Stephen Greer, who categorically says that they're benevolent, and I totally agree with him, and Clifford Stone. Uh, Clifford is one of the few people who uh, fights tooth and nail against the belief that they're contrary. And I have to admit, um, few people have had the courage to... Clifford has had to come out and to point people in the right direction towards understanding the UFO and the alien phenomenon. While I'm on the subject of Clifford, let me just grab something. I've just uh, received yesterday and read since then um, Clifford's new book, Clifford Stone's new book by Paola Harris 
And um, Paola is a, an Italian-American investigator, and she's done a fantastic job on helping Clifford pull together his story. Uh, there's a lot of interviews in here, and, and there's a bit of Clifford's story as written by himself. So this is one of the few books that I would recommend in this whole field. But one thing I should warn you is, unless you're familiar with how Clifford talks, um, it may seem very disjointed. Also, um, one thing that Clifford makes clear is he doesn't breach his security oath at all. So he has spent the last 30 years collecting documents to point people in the right direction in terms of uncovering the truth. As he describes, it's like the tip of the iceberg, and if he can show people the tip, then they can find the iceberg. And so that's really what this book is all about, which you can pick up on Amazon. And um, he doesn't really go into his own experiences a great deal, except he does talk about his own entity, Corona. Um, and he talks a little bit about the loss of his son and the impact that had on him. His son was really the driving force for him to come out and start talking publicly about uh, what happened. You know, his son died and, and he felt compelled to follow his son's wishes. I recommend, you know, do yourself a favour and get the book and also listen to as many as, of Clifford's interviews as possible because there's a lot of information in the other interviews that Clifford's done. Hi. Hi. Um, see you, kiddo. And there's a lot of information in those interviews that you don't get in the book. So it's well worth kind of putting the two together, if you like, and that way you'll get a clearer sense of what he did as an interfacer working with aliens. Um, there's only one other person I know on the planet who has done similar work, uh, probably more classified. Um, but he is one of the few out there with a legitimate story to tell. Uh, so, what else do I need to tell you about as a bit of a background? Oh yeah, um, when I set out on the night to have the encounter, I was very nervous and um, when I first went down there, I think I went, I've got my notes somewhere on the whole experience, I think I left at quarter, par, quarter to 9pm and came back uh, quarter past 12, something like that, so it was approximately three hours. What seemed to have taken place that I later discovered may have been five or six hours in length. It might have been a whole day. I'm still not sure. What I first thought happened is I came back and uh, spoke to my partner about it and she felt there was more to the story than I realised. And um, it seemed like I'd had numerous interactions with lights, picked up on things telepathically and then at the end very clearly saw a triangular formation of three lights moving towards the belt of Orion and then they disappeared. Um, two first and then one after. And I came back kind of disappointed and then later I was able to do some work with um, two gifted psychics who rather than doing standard kind of regressive hypnosis which is you know, practice that I use myself in my own counselling work. Uh, they're able to connect with the actual event and, and see what I'm trying to convey and ask the right questions, um, triggers if you like, to help me unpack more of what I believed happened. So I was able to do that with them. They're also able to telepathically connect with the ETs at the time and validate what's happening or um, ask critical questions once again relating to those trigger points so that I would be prompted in a direction um, where there was information to be found. So I did more than 20 hours with them and that work still hasn't finished but I've parked it for a while. Uh, I've had another well, I've probably had five encounters since then, um, another major one in the last month or so. So maybe one day I'll go back and see if I can unpack more of what happened. But at the very least, what I want to tell you is uh, a lot happened 
and it totally transformed my view of reality. As I said before, I'm essentially a Buddhist, and I guess my belief was that we have, uh, how to describe it, you know, our essential essence, um, Buddhists call it the mind stream, and many contemporary Buddhists struggle to understand the idea of reincarnation versus no belief in the soul. Buddhism doesn't talk about the soul or God, and yet it talks about the mind stream and it talks about reincarnation. So my essential belief was that there is this form of essence, this mind stream if you like, um, that continues beyond this life and even in the life after death, uh, there is a choice that people who are truly self-aware can make to dissolve back, if you like, or let go and return to, for want of a better word, source. Um, God, whatever you want to call it. But essentially, uh, we're connected to that anyway. So I had this kind of belief about that being the soul, not, not a clearly defined belief, that, that's what I believe, but I kind of also believe the Buddhist take on that, um, the idea of I and emptiness, that essentially what we take to be a self is entirely empty, a fabrication. Um, and it's really the five kind of aggregates, as Buddhists describe it, that come together that create this idea of self or this um, belief of self, this uh, feeling of self. So I had that idea, and then after this experience, uh, you know, in one night all of that was shattered. And I haven't reassembled it back to coherent belief. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a journey, and I'm going to tell you in different places what happened, and hopefully convey some of the emotion that came with that, and, and what what I felt at the time and some of the confusion, some of the, the pain um, and exhilaration and show you a little bit about where it happened and what I saw and hopefully out of that you'll get a sense of a legitimate story um, it's really shattered my view of reality and it's not easy to talk about because it's, I'm still very emotional when I go through things and there's still a lot I don't know. Um, and, and what I hope you get as well is that what seemed like coherent sequence, you know, I thought I went away for um, three hours approximately. But in fact, I was away a lot longer. And that's typical for ETs to, um, you know, dilate uh, or compress or expand time. Um, but not only is that in there, the fact that there was actually a lot more time, there is also this sense that I, I went in and out of different events, as if when I'd had enough they took me out and I returned to reality. And when I first recalled it, it, it was as if there was a linear narrative, you know, I went down, I set things up, I had this encounter, I came back. When I learned the truth of what happened, there was no linear narrative. Now, maybe the reality is there was, but it was as if I was coming and going in and out, in and out, in and out of this reality. Uh, and time means very different things when you're doing that. So, um, I don't know if you'll get a sense of that, but I'll try my best anyway. I want to put this on record because I know I have a lot more encounters coming and I also know there are a lot of people trying to do what I'm doing who are trying to have conscious encounters and there's a lot of doubt out there and I want to say to people that you have to have faith you have to connect with the feeling more than anything forget your mind forget this you have to connect with the feeling and the feeling of connectedness to everything and it is possible to connect with many different beings in the universe and have very much objective face-to-face -face encounters with them and more than one person at a time. 
but they know when you're ready and when you're not and they know when you're hiding things from yourself or them they pretty much know everything about you so if you've got insidious intentions don't ever think you're going to have contact with them because you won't so I'm putting this out there I guess as um, you know one little story in humanity's archive of things that have happened and really just a little stepping stone on the path for us to becoming a mature species and coming of age in the Milky Way if you like maybe one day I'll be able to try and teach other people how to do this but for now I'm finding my own way through my own experiences and most importantly I want to convey what I said at the beginning that none of these entities are hostile none of them they are entirely compassionate and benevolent and they don't have an agenda they are doing what they have always done and you need to use a cosmic kind of view to get your head around that they have been around a very long time and have a lot of experience in first contact there will be many people who will jump up and down and say well you know you don't know what you're talking about and David Icke knows more than you do and um, you know so and so is channeling this and channeling that and sure part of that is a legitimate thing in the phenomenon but I challenge those people to really look deeply and to unearth um, the people that they're, they're relying upon for their information find out what really makes them tick and whether they genuinely have self-awareness and also there are religious people out there who would say this is all the work of the devil look I'm sorry for you you know if you've been conditioned that badly that you think that our extraterrestrial friends are not uh, you know part of God's creation well what can I say you know you've made your bed lie in it I can't say anything to convince you otherwise except to tell you that they have great compassion for us and if you knew reality or the reality that I've learned about you would see them with very different eyes and you'd probably abandon everything that you think you believe now the ETs aren't here to shatter anybody's religion and neither am I but if they came down wham bam thank you ma'am and conveyed everything they know there would be no religion it would be abandoned but they don't do that, they're respectful, they're considerate they honour who we are and what we believe um, I wish human beings did that but we don't do it very well I think that's about all I have to say for now so it's just about 7 o'clock here, daylight savings um, has been smoky as we've had fire in the mountains I'll need to recharge this battery and hopefully there will be enough light to get going and it might take us about an hour to put everything together so I'll see you outside Cowbunga <laughs>